Let me introduce you to my Warco drill press. But could it be improved? Welcome to episode two. So in this video, we'll have a look at the inverter. So we'll deep dive into that. And then we'll start making the control box and the control panel. And we'll talk about how they're going to interface and talk to each other. So to start with, we're going to kick off with, I feel like machining something. I haven't machined anything for a bit. So we'll start with the control box. Right, so now we're going to make the control box here. So we'll make this up in individual pieces, fabricate it and then assemble it. So the back panel will have slots machined in it to take these side pieces. And then you've got these bars at the side that will also have slots machined in them, uh, also to take those side pieces to kind of slot in. And then on the reverse of this front panel, there'll also be um, slots machined in that to take those panels. So it will kind of interlock together and then we'll just screw it together uh, each of the corners on the main control panel itself so we've got on and off then we've got the speed control for the spindle speed via the inverter uh, then we've got uh, reverse zero and forward for the direction control um, we'll be running forward most of the time but if we were trying to extract a broken screw or something and we want to put a left hand drill in we might want to run in reverse to do that uh, then we've got an e-stop which just kills all the power and then finally these jog buttons which will jog the spindle very slowly clockwise or counterclockwise um, if we're tapping. So they'll be set up to run it quite slowly. So you can just slowly tap in, back out, tap in, back out uh, to work on a thread. Right, let's get started. Okay, and here's the last of those spaces complete. So you can see they've all been turned down to size, they've all been drilled and tapped. M5 at each end. And these will be like the corner pieces in the control cabinet. So just to show you what we've got to do next. So there's two drawings here. They're very similar. They've just got a slightly different uh, angle. So essentially what we need to do is machine. Have a look at this one machine two slots all the way down one side you can see in this side view here down that side and then almost at 90 degrees to it so this one we've got uh, an obtuse angle so it's slightly past it's 4.76 degrees past 90 degrees uh, for this second slot to kind of angle it out a little bit and then on the other one 4.76 degrees inward so an acute angle less than 90 degrees uh, for the slot on that one. So there's two like that and there's two like that. And I haven't got a rotary fixture or anything, any kind of fourth axis, anything like that. So what I'm going to do is I've just done a quick sketch here of roughly what I'm going to make. So this will be a kind of fixture that will bolt onto the end of that uh, that bar there and that allow me to index it round to get the two angles that I need. And to make this piece that goes on the end to give me those angles I've just squared up this piece of stock, so we're going to hold it in the vise like that and machine some of the features on the top and make two of those, one with the slightly 
obtuse angle, one with a slightly uh, acute angle. Right, let's go to the CNC machine and get started on that. Okay, so here it is, the little fixture to enable me to machine those grooves on the side. Looks a bit like a carbide insert, doesn't it? Uh, anyway, the way this works is, so you've got an M5 screw, that just goes through there. Goes into the thread. And here's the second one. So it's similar to that, but it's the, the opposite hand. So let's just show you what that one will look like. So there. Not easy to show, but it kind of, there we go. They're opposite to each other with opposite angles. So one's got an obtuse angle and one's got an acute angle. And you can see what I've got in there is some little witness marks that just show exactly uh, where each groove is going to be. So there'll be one there and one there, and then on the other one, one there, and then one there. And that should give me the two grooves at the different angles to make up the housing. Okay, so we've got the bar uh, clamped in the vise there, and here's that little fixture. And I've just marked up uh, where the grooves have got to be, just so I don't make any mistakes and then I've just got that up on parallels and then use this uh, edge at the back here to square up against so we now square against that edge which means that slot's going to be in the correct position and when we do the other side we'll index this round and that will tell us the position for the next slot that we need okay so I've touched off on the part I've centered it along that center line let's go and cut the first groove So then I cleaned up that raw edge so I'd have a nice uh, clean edge to go against the vice jaw because I needed to rotate this around 90 degrees so there you can see it's uh, quite nicely cleaned up ready to take the next cut in the next slot so I pushed it back down onto the parallels and you can see that edge I've machined is now uh, against the vice jaw so that's why I needed to clean that up then we just set that square using that fixture push it down on the parallels and then tighten the jaw and we're ready to machine the next slot which is slightly under 90 degrees Okay, so that's the last of them complete. So you can see the two channels machined down there. That's where the insert panels will go. And then the M5 tapped holes there. So we've got a pair with the inside acute angles and a pair with the obtuse angles. that will make a kind of shape. So the next thing we need to do is look at the paneling. This is the new control panel from Play. It'll be about here somewhere. I'm just marking out on that um, where the holes are into the casting. So the back of that box that I'm going to make uh, will pick up on those screw threads. So we'll take that off, measure those, and then I can make sure I've got the holes in the right places. 
Right, so here's my sheet. This is a three millimeter piece of aluminium. It's 500 by 500, and it's a little bit wide to go on the machine. So what I've done, I've just drawn all the panels that are going to go into the control box uh, as a separate drawing, just to see how they're going to fit on there. And then these holes here indicate where I can cut those down. So um, I had two cut points, one here and here. Actually, it turns out I can get all of that on. So what I'll do, I'll just trim off the excess here, which is this second line. And then the main shapes that I need to make the box will be on the top there. And we'll put that on the CNC machine. So I'll bring you back when I've done that and got it all uh, clamped down, ready to go. Right, so I've got the stock clamped down. I've roughly marked out all the different shapes. I've picked up um, a zero that I know is going to fit all those shapes into the material. Uh, first operation is we're going to uh, pocket out some holes in the centre here there for all the controls to go in and that will give us somewhere to provide additional clamping. So as you can see I'm having to machine this quite slowly and carefully and apply lots of WD-40 to prevent it coming up the cutter. Now the reason is this is uh, 1050 grade of aluminium so it's a thousand series which is great if you want to fold it or form it into shapes but it because it's 100% aluminium basically um, it does like to gum up the cutters Um, I managed to make an error in cam there and that slot there that should be two millimeters deep is three millimeters which means it's actually gone all the way through to the other side so it's not really so much of a slot it's uh, completely cut through so that was the front panel so I've got enough material to make another one uh, I'll come back to that a bit later so now I've got the rear panel here I've got all the slots cut the holes cut out uh, and then I've just gone around the perimeter as a rough cut now I'm just going to do the finished cut to bring it to final size Once I cut it out, I had to clean up all the edges. I just use one of those uh, regular deburring tools just to get rid of the worst parts. And then buffed it up with some Scotch Brite. And then it was on to just cleaning up those holes where it just raised some slight burrs. Quite like using these snail counter sinks, do quite a nice job. Okay, there's the back panel finished. Okay, before we go too much further, we better check if uh, at least the concept's going to work. So I've put one of the tubes in there. You can see these slots are now lined up. So we'll do the other one and then we'll see if the top panel fits. So it should be that one. Just loosely line up, or roughly line up those slots. Okay. And we'll put the top panel in. So this hole is for the cabling to go in. That'll have a, a grommet in it, and that's on the that's the inside. So that'll go that way. Okay, there you 
think you start to see the idea and then it's a little bit proud there that will go into the slot in the top panel that goes on here looks like that's going to work quite nicely so this is the rear panel that will get screwed to the machine that's the top panel will be a similar one here similar one here and these two rods will go in the corners one there one there and then there's some earthing points here to allow me to earth the machine it looks like it's going to work so I'll bring you back when we've got the rest of the panels ready Okay, now we have the final side piece. It's starting to come together now. Yeah, pleased with that. Before we make the front panel, we better check that the inverter works as expected in case we need to make any changes. So as promised in the previous episodes, we'll deep dive into all the parameters in here. We'll have a look at where the defaults in here differ from the instructions that came with it and see where they're different. We'll also deep dive into each of the parameters and then explain what they all mean and just go through, try and simplify it because it can be very daunting. You you get hit with all these different numbers and diagrams and all sorts of stuff. It can be a little bit complicated. So we'll try and break it down into little sections and then go through each of those in turn. Okay, so at the moment we're in run stop mode and we don't want to do that yet because we haven't set all the parameters. So we need to go into the programming mode. Now in the instructions, with a lot of these devices they'll just point to the key and just say this does that, this does that. Uh, personally I find it easier to follow kind of little block diagram so I'll just keep that on there. Um, and then that walks you through the sequence and you always keep it to hand so you can step yourself through the different phases or the different uh, uh, processes. So we're currently in run stop over this side so to get into the programming mode we need to press program which is the button here so we'll do that and now we come up with P and it's flashing P0. So we're in the programming section. Now we um, we can either have a look at what's in that particular, stored in that particular variable. Uh, so if we go, we're on zero. So if we press, we want to see what's in that one, if we press function, and that will allow us to view the value. So we'll go on to, well, the label it fung. I'm sure that means func, function. So let's press that. Now it's telling you 220. So the value stored in there is currently 220. If well, we've got two options here, if we wanted to change that value, we've now got the up down keys. So we can press the up down keys and change that. And it's only operating on the one that's flashing at the moment. So if you want to change the other numbers, you have to press the display button there and it will move the flashing number across and you can move that one up and down and so on. So that's your change there, press display, that enables you to index across to which number you want to change. When you're happy, or if you don't want to make a change, like we don't want to now, you can come down this route here, you press function again, so we haven't done anything, we're going to press function. It says end, which means, okay, I've accepted, if you have made a change, we've accepted a change, and then we're now back to this stage here. So at this stage here, we've got two options. We can either index through each of the numbers using up down keys, or if we're happy, we press program and come out again. So let's just exit out. 
I'm now back in run stop mode. Remember, we haven't really changed anything, so we do need to change some of the parameters. So let's go back into program. We're now here. And we had a look at zero, didn't we? So let's have a look at one. And there, so at this point here, now we press function. We can have a look and see what's in there. And it's 50. Um, I know that refers to 50 hertz for the motor plate, so I'm not going to change that. And we'll go back around. So we want to come out, press function, end back again. You'll notice it jumps to number two, so it's it's quite useful. So you can just keep uh, uh, quite quickly sort of working your way down the list. Uh, so that's an overview. If I just keep it on the screen, that might be something that's useful to you. Other brands have some similar functionality, and it's worth uh, drawing it out. I think as a block diagram. Okay, so this is the actual sheet that came with it. So I'll just hold that on the screen. There we are. You can see um, it's telling you about. Uh, so we've got this one here. We've got the AT1, uh, AT2 for different phases in and out, and AT3 are also shown. But we're interested in uh, AT1. So you can sort of see how it's all wired together. That's the mains coming in. We've got our motor there, UVW. We've already done that. Here's the digital ports. We'll come back to that a little bit later. Here's how we can control the speed of our potentiometer. Again, we'll come back to that. Uh, there's an optional relay output. Now I notice on this unit uh, there was nothing fitted on the board there so I don't know if you're supposed to try and solder some terminals in um, but there's nothing fit on the board currently and we only have one uh, open collector output only an SP1 uh, some models I guess like this one have a one and two uh, I'm not sure we're going to use those yet I'll probably just go with the digital ones and then in terms of wiring it just gives you a little bit more detail there then it starts going into a whole host of things so there's Something about the terminals there, the digital terminals, uh, auxiliary connections there, the different speeds. This actually takes a little while to decode exactly what they're referring to. There's also, as I say, you know how to control the panel, but I think the little block diagram walkthrough is a little bit easier than trying to uh, refer to this all the time. Then on the other side, we've got this. As I say, it's quite daunting, so you've got... Yeah, how to go through the programming, uh, all the different functions and settings and what they all do, uh, error codes down there. So I think, especially if, you've, if you're new to these, this is, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, where do you start? Because uh, some of these need to be changed for this motor and some of them uh, are fine. So what I've done is, so I've created my own version. So we've got all the parameters listed here here and here and I've color coded it so it doesn't look too daunting uh, so we've got the green which is um, everything you need to know to get that motor going so you need to know frequencies and number of poles and things like that uh, if you get it wrong I don't know if it'll damage it but it certainly won't work correctly so the green ones you need to get right so there's some of those uh, the blue ones are optional tuning parameters so you don't need those straight away so again you can not worry about those those are things like do you want to run it from here or do you want an external control for the start, stop, and speed, and so on? Uh, then there's some uh, purple ones, which are oh, sorry, purple ones, which are to do with what do you want to do with that signal? So the digital inputs. If I see that signal, what do you want me to do? Again, you don't need to worry about that straight away. That's more for how you're specifically going to use this, um, and with any inputs and outputs you're going to use. Uh, white I've defined as advanced users, so I I think maybe arguably you wouldn't even get into those and then finally the grey ones means they're either not defined uh, they're not required or they're just completely not documented so again we don't need to worry about those so let's just talk you through what each of those basic areas mean in a bit more detail okay let's have a closer look at what we've got here so we've got these the green ones are the ones you need to configure uh, for the motor you're going to use and the voltage range and so on so that's these parameters here, there's a couple down the bottom there. And if you look through the rest of the sheet, sorry, just quickly, you can see there are no other green ones. So actually it narrows it down uh, to the ones that you, you really need to uh, put in first. So those are the green ones. Then the blue ones, uh, they're here. We've got some there, here, and here on the next page. Some at the bottom down here. Again, these are like user preference type configurations. And then there's a few towards the end. And so again, you don't need to worry about those straight away. And then purple ones, they're just here. 
These are to do with the digital inputs and outputs and how you want to handle those again. You don't need to worry about those straight away. And then we've got the whites and greys, which uh, I won't go into in any particular detail. So let's go into these green ones then. So the first two are relatively straightforward. So the first one is the maximum voltage. We can get that off the motor plate. Now the default was 220, so I'm just going to leave that because that's close enough. Uh, the reference frequency is also on the motor plate and that's 50 hertz. Uh, we'll also run off 60 hertz, but uh, we've got 50 hertz here in the UK. Uh, the rest of them uh, probably need a small picture just to explain generally what's going on here, but we're sort of defining the way the motor works in its operating range and speed range, so we're going to give it some kind of limits and then it can work out how it's going to control that motor from that. So some of you might remember from a previous video that we went through very briefly how the inverters work and how they control the motor. So just a quick recap, so we've got our mains coming in, 230 volts in the UK, gets rectified through the full bridge rectifier, gets smoothed by bank capacitors, and then we've basically got DC here, and they're switched on and off rapidly by these IGBT switches, and using PWM control, they uh, essentially create these sine waves, and we've got our three sine waves with 120 degree phase shift notionally between them, that go into the three phases of the motor. Uh, what we didn't really talk about was um, the control and how the speed is varied. So in addition to that, um, well, we need to change the frequency. So a higher frequency makes the motor turn faster. Uh, there's a bit of a downside or um, something I watched there. So as you do that, if you keep the voltage constant, uh, you can, I believe the, the way it works is you get, you saturate the magnetic flux and therefore the motors don't work properly. So what you end up being having to do is to, when you can vary the frequency to vary the speed, you also need to vary the voltage. Um, we'll just draw that out and then it might explain what some of these parameters are referring to and also help us again a little bit further when we look at this torque boost feature. Okay, so I guess pictorially there's um, a kind of, how can we do this? Yeah, let's just do it in here. There's a kind of speed control. aspect to it and we need to vary the frequency and we need to vary the voltage um, to make the motor run correctly. So now we're going to have a look at the relationship between that voltage and frequency and some a basic way that it's going to operate the drive and we're going to be referring back to these parameters here so we've got the maximum voltage on the motor plate and the reference frequency of the motor we'll need the intermediate voltage and intermediate frequency and then the minimum voltage and frequency uh, we'll touch on the other two in a moment so we need to draw it out like this. So we've got voltage on this axis and frequency on this. And this is in Hertz. And if we look on our motor plate, we're going to be running this delta, so 220 volts. So we need to put 220 volts as our maximum. We've got an intermediate of 110 and a minimum of zero. So we'll put those down here. So that's our zero. Uh, that'd be 110 and our 220. And then in terms of frequency, uh, the motor itself is rated on the plate at 50 Hertz. And we'll be running as there's an intermediate frequency of, there we go, of 25 Hertz. So, put our 50 there and our 25 there so we'll be putting a point here which is 50 Hertz to 20 volts and then our intermediate frequency and intermediate voltage is about here and here and then we've got zero and zero for each of those so this should be a straight line between there and there so that's that point and that's that point there that's a very basic operation, but of course the whole point in these motors is the ability through the, the inverter to run at uh, higher speeds, so kind of overspeed the motor. So in my case, uh, I'm going to run this up to 120 hertz. So here's our 100. And 120 is about there. So that's this point here. Now we can't go any higher than the 220 volts because we damage the motor. And so it will end up capping that across like that. So that's how we're going to be running it. And that's our, that's a very basic uh, V over F scalar control. 
where this slope is essentially const oops, constant all the way down. That's our V over F ratio. So that's to basically get the motor running. Now to put this into some kind of perspective down here, uh, let's put it in speed terms in RPM. So we'll do RPM. Now this is a four pole motor, so we'll do it for a four pole motor. So at the nameplate we'll be running, I think it was about 1420 RPM. And then there'll be half that in here and so on, so that'll be uh, 7, 10, and then 0. And then it'll over speed all the way up. So we've got uh, 40 there, so it's going to be somewhere around 3000 RPM if we had a one-to-one -one pulley ratio. So obviously we can play around with that, but that's the kind of speed map we got. Um, if we had a two-pole two motor, and all these speeds would be double, so your 2840 would be here, and then this would be a 1420 here, zero. So it would go twice as fast all the way up. Uh, and if we had a six pole, it would carry on like that. But we're gonna be running with a uh, four pole, so we're gonna be running this speed range here. So we also need to tell it the number of poles, so a zero on this inverter means two poles, a one means four poles, and two is six poles, so the default is zero for a two pole motor, but this is a four pole motor, so we're gonna change that to one. Uh, the other things we need to tell it are, we need to tell it that we're running the maximum operating frequency, we're running at 120 hertz, and our minimum is 10. So on here, it will make sure it will extend this range so that we can go up to our 120, which is here. And then when you turn the potentiometer down to a minimum, it will actually, well, it should stop at 10. So that's basic, uh, that's a basic motor setup. That's what these parameters are doing, kind of getting this, uh, this graph going, setting all these parameters. Okay, so we're now in the run mode, we've come out of program mode. So when we press run there, it should go to whatever frequency we declared. So we'll, let's just put that, I don't know, somewhere random like that. And we press run. And the motor accelerates up to that frequency and holds it. Now we've got two options here. Either we can just stop the motor, or decelerate back down again, or when it's running, we can run it at a slightly higher speed. And again, we can run stop from there. The other thing you'll notice is, I'm quite pleased about this, the cooling fan only comes on when the motor's running, which means for filming and so on, uh, it won't be too noisy. So when I hit stop, fan stops as well. So there we go, we've got the parameters set, uh, we've got our speed range set, and then we can just use the run stop to start the motor. Okay, so while we're here, we'll just see what happens if we run it at the full 120 hertz, that's the full speed. Now it's not bolted down, so it may vibrate, I don't know, let's see what happens. So we'll hit run. Please so far. So because we can't see the labels very well, I've just drawn them out again here. So we've got a 10 volt supply is the first pin, then we've got the digital channels, so from X1 to X6, and then the digital common, so these all go together. Then we've got the analog side here, so we've got a reference voltage, or this can be used for reference current as well. The 5 volt, 5 volt supply, uh, this is the open collector channel, I don't think we're going to use that, and then there's an analog common, so these are the analog ones, and then the digital ones are these ones here. So now we're going to start looking at this purple section. So these are the multiple inputs and outputs, so they're on X1, X2, 3, 4, 5 and 6. 
and then this is the, this definition is the same for all of them. I just haven't repeated them, and it's currently defaulted to come up as 13, which means it will select the speed input based on the parameters in parameter 27. But before we can use this external speed input, uh, we need to set one of the parameters in blue. Let's go and show you that one. So if you remember these optional parameters, so we're going to do. So we've got optional for the speed controls currently on the potentiometer. So we can make that external uh, by changing that to number three. Uh, sorry, number two. Uh, and then the start stop, well, we're going to do that external as well through those input outputs. So we need to turn uh, select two for this parameter. So let's go and change those parameters. And then we can make use of these digital input outputs down here and remotely control this from the control box front panel. So now we should find the start stop on here. Yeah, they don't work. And the variable speed doesn't work either. That's because we've now told it to look at these input outputs here. So let's go and do that next. Okay, so we've just set the parameters in here so that the uh, run stop signals are done externally from here. And also the speed control is picked up from this potentiometer rather than using this potentiometer and using these run stops. So what we've got on this potentiometer is we've connected it like that. So the potentiometer is connected across the common and I'm using the five volts. And then we've got the signal that reads off that with the various the voltage that goes into VL1. So that's giving us our speed signal. So we've got them wired in like that. Okay, so uh, let's switch on and give it a go. So we're gonna connect common to X4 which is here. Now running at 26 hertz. Turn the potentiometer and go all the way up to 120. Okay, so that's using the potentiometer to control the speed. Now the other thing we can do, rather than shorting out X4, if we short out X5, which is that one, we can run in reverse. So if we go F4 again, so now we're going forward, you might not be able to see on there, but it's going uh, this way around clockwise. Let that come to a halt. Connect F, uh, X5 instead. It's now running the other way, anti-clockwise. So that's our forward in reverse. So all we need to do is make up our three position switch that connects either X4 or X5 for our forward and reverse. And then we have some start stop run switches. So the next thing we're going to get working is for the thread tapping, we want to jog the machine at a given fixed speed. So I want that to be independent of what we've got this set to, because I might have just drilled a hole at a certain RPM and you just want a, a fixed, fairly slow tap into the material and then tap out slowly at the same speed. So to do that, we're going to connect the common to X1, which will jog it at a predetermined speed or frequency. At the moment, it's at 45, which is a little bit high, but just for the principle, it will run at 45 uh, hertz. Then we're going to connect X4 to common as well. So X4 makes it start, and joining X1 as well means please start, but ignore the potentiometer, but run at the set internal speed. So it's a little bit fiddly. So with this little wire, I'm going to join X1 to common, which is across there to there. And you'll see, oh, when I do that, it's come up with 45 on the display, but you'll notice the motor, motor hasn't run that. So this is X1 to common, run at this set internal speed. Again, I'll, I'll make that a lot lower, because that's too fast, I think, for tapping. And then we want X4, which is that one. So now the motor spins up and it runs at 45 hertz, so that will be tapping into the material. And then we do X5, and now it's tapping out of the material. Again, running a bit slower than that. Now I'm going off hands to show you, but if I now 
move this to a radically different position like say I don't know say there oh in fact it's come up that's maximum speed 120 Hertz but if we repeat that so I'm going to X X1 to common which means please run at the set internal speed instead and then run that on X4 and it just goes to 45 Ah, you know, actually that's interesting. Yeah, I wonder if it might do that. So if I... and then... Oh, well, that wasn't a good idea. Right. So, so now we do that again. Now this is tending to jog, 45. Now if I take the X1 connection off, now it ramps up to the speed set by the potentiometer, which is, <laughs> in fact, full speed. Okay, so that's kind of how it all works. So all we really need to do is um, get these configured in our control box. So all our different switches and relays that we've got in the control box simulate what I've just done there. And then we've got forward, backward, full speed range, emergency stop, um, and the jogging modes as well. So we were using the multi-function input, so we've got X1, X2, 3, 4, 5 and 6 and by default they're configured to give um, the options we just talked about there but they could be connected to a whole range of different inputs so you've got whether you want to use a key momentary contact to start stop uh, there's something called a three-wire control you can look that up but that allows you to uh, have a kind of self-contained, um, fairly nice little forward-backward uh, wire control system. Uh, there's all sorts of different options down here, and you can see that at the moment, uh, pin 1, if you short that to COM, then the default is option 13, and 13 is please run at a fixed speed input 1, C parameter 27. So if we go to 27, uh, that's here, parameter 27 is currently set at 45, but we could either change that or we could make it run at a, a number of other different speeds down here as well. So there's lots of different options there. Then the other ones were we did forward and reverse. So we were using X4 and X5 because they're the defaults. They're currently connected to option 5 and option 6 and 5 is wire forward operation and 6 reverse operation. So we, we made those connections. So lots of different combinations and permutations um, of how you want to do that control. But hopefully that's it's starting to make a little bit more sense. So let's look down this list. So we went through the green ones here. These were originally configuring the motor. So we had the uh, the voltage one to run at, uh, the, the the rated frequency, the reference frequency of the motor from the motor plate. So those it, it definitely needs those to run. And then we also went down here and we put the number of poles in. So this is a four pole motor, so we put that in. And that was basically getting the whole motor running. We then looked at whether we want the speed control to be internal or we moved it to external and that enabled me to use these uh, terminals at the back here, the X1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. Uh, to make that work externally because we want to run it off the control panel. Uh, start, stop, we also moved that externally as well. Uh, sorry, that one was the potentiometer, wasn't it? A start, stop, move that externally. Uh, this one was already on brake stop, which gives a little bit of DC injection braking uh, to try and uh, sort of slow the motor down by applying a little bit of voltage, that's already set, we didn't change that. Where else? These are greyed out, greyed out, uh, operating arrival, don't know what that is, didn't change that. Over temperature protection, 80 degrees, I left that, seems sensible. Uh, reduction ratio is, ah uh, yeah, this is rated, this is related to the pulley uh, and the speed readout, so we'll, we'll yeah, we'll come back to that one. The carrier setting. Uh, this is, so we touched on this in the last video, so it doesn't give a unit here, but I assume it's kilohertz, so 10 kilohertz would make sense, and that's the default, and it's currently at the maximum. What this one is about is... Uh, so in the last video we looked at this PWM down here, and this delta t, or this distance in time, this tiny little 
distance in time. If you go one over that, that gives you the frequency. So this is the frequency which is carrying or switching the system on and off to give these pulses. So the sort of faster you do that, the smoother the whole thing's going to be and better resolution you've kind of got. Uh, the downside is then your, your motor wire acts more and more like an antenna and there's potential for interference. Uh, so it's well, a bit of trial and error really. They've left it at 10. We'll see how we get on. We may just come back. But it sounded pretty smooth. But the lower you go down there, the rougher it's going to sound and uh, it's not going to give such a nice drive signal. Uh, the other ones were the frequency adjusting step size. Oh, we left that alone. That's um, the resolution that you want to use to change this one. Overload protection. I don't know. I guess that's about how long it will sustain um, excess current for. Three seconds. Okay, we left that. Poles we talked about. Working frequency. I think I asked earlier about that. I don't know if that's different to the motor plate frequency. I haven't changed it and it runs okay. Then these are the internal default speed settings that you can choose. So if you remember the, the jog mode, we're going to make use of this section one here and just run at 45 hertz, or I'll change that and reduce it down. Then you've got the acceleration rates for all those same settings. So you can have diff default speeds and default acceleration settings. You can also have default deceleration ratings. And on the other side, we just went through that. This is the parameters for X1, X2, X3, X4, X5, X6 are the digital inputs and this is configuring how you want that to behave. Then you've got some that are not documented. Uh, SP1, it calls it an open collector, so assume it's some kind of um, very low current drain of some kind of transistor output. I'm not sure, I'm not planning on using that one anyway. SP2, we don't have that on this model, it would just be an additional one of these. Then we've got the display options. So this is blue because this is something that you might want to display. So at the moment it's set to uh, one, the operating frequency. I'm going to leave it like that for now, but you can change it to RPM, but you have to take into account the pulleys that you're using or any ratios because you really want this to be spindle or quill RPM. So you need to take account of any uh, ratios in your pulleys. Now you can also look at current, which is quite a nice handy one if you want to make sure you're not going to overload the motor. Uh, temperature would be interesting. Um, I don't think I'll put that one up, but depends on the application, that might be interesting. Time, I guess, is how long you've been running the motor for. I'm not sure. I'll probably just stick with operating frequency for now and then a bit of time. Um, when it finally goes in installation, I've worked out what pulleys I want, I'll go to RPM. And down here, power options. This is really, for, I guess, for industrial use if you wanted to, when it comes on, show what the errors were, or if you want it to come on and it always already goes in forward or reverse. Again, this is probably some kind of automation. Uh, these ones down here, I've left them white because I think you probably really, wouldn't really want to touch those. Input stabilization, I don't know what that is. It might be to do with the V2F curve calculation, not sure. And then voltage coefficient could be the same thing. Again, I've left them at defaults. Uh, the under and over voltage, it will come up a warning on here if it goes outside the low voltage or higher voltage. So we're running at 230, so those default values seem sensible, so I've left those alone. Nearly there now. Right, last sheet. So we'll come back to this bit because it does need a little dedicated section. This is where we do the torque compensation. So this is about, remember that V2F curve? This is about if you want to deviate a little bit from that to get a little bit of low speed torque. So P70, 71 and 72 are all about that. Again, we'll come on to that in a minute. Uh, the max external analog and min, um, I don't know what those refer to zero current compensation. Again, because they're in this section, I suspect they're to do with the, um, the torque compensation. I'm not entirely sure. Current coefficient, I believe, is the maximum current that uh, the system will put out, so um, we need to match that to the motor. Then these ones about jog, f or jog forward and reverse, they're not the jog that I was talking about. I would, I'm going to use an internal um, setting for my set speed, but on the front panel here, as a facility to jog the machine, you want to index it round, but that's really something separate. I don't, I'm not going to implement it like that. But they're the frequencies you want to run at, and the um, this will be yeah the speed you want to run at, or the sorry these are the accelerations you want to run at. And then if you're in those jog modes, this front panel jog mode, not the way I'm going to do it. And then it's how do you want to stop? Do you want it just to coast down, or do some uh, DC voltage injection and stop it that way? Pleased to know the rest of the parameters are either not applicable or they're not actually there and there's some, yeah, a few industrial use. 
you might want to know how many hours are left on the inverter, how long it's been running for, when it's probably going to um, need replacing or something like that. And that is it. So what I'll do, I'll just put these in front of the camera to see if... Uh, let me do a wider shot. Oh, okay, so here's the complete list. That's page one. Here's page two. So this is where we talked about those uh, digital inputs. Okay. And here's the final page. Now the other thing that's worth noting, because we are going to cap off this voltage here, because we can't carry on forever, uh, there's a consequence of that in terms of the torque output. So if we draw that down here, trying to keep it in line, this is our torque, and then this is our frequency here. So if this is our 100%, 50, and 0, and we take that 50 point there, and our, what are we going up to? 120. And we take our 100 across there. So first we're keeping a nice uh, level of torque, so it's quickly going to boost up something like that. And we'll get to this point. After that, the torque's going to fall away because we can't keep increasing the voltage. And so, not necessarily to scale, but it simply sort of fall away like that. But that's allowing us to run at the higher speed, but it will have this kind of, something like that kind of torque characteristic. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the torque compensation option. So this inverter is fairly basic, so it doesn't have any encoder feedback information. There's no, there's nothing to plug in, there's nothing to connect in that point, from that point of view. Um, it looks like it's just doing um, a torque compensation, so a very basic kind of torque boost for low speed running. Uh, so nothing complicated, I don't think it's got like vector control, certainly not closed loop in any case. Uh, so this is essentially what it's doing here. So these are the parameters, so if we go P70, so P70 the default is 0, uh, which means it's not on. As soon as we set that to 1, then what it means is it will look at the two parameters below, which is 71 and 72, and the words, as written in the manual, there's no other explanation, there's no, um, it's a little bit light on explanation, but what it says is it multiplies P72 by P71 minus input voltage. And the default settings for P71 are between 100 and 300. Um, but actually, the well, that's the ranges that it quotes that you're allowed to have. But the factory default is zero. So that's a bit odd. Maybe it's a typo on one of those. Um, and then the torque compensation settings between zero and 100, which I assume is percent. And that's currently set to 10. Again, I assume percent. And I think what this actually is ending up doing is that at the very high voltage, uh, this compensation ends up being very, very small. As you come down in voltage or down it, as you're going slower and slower and slower, this term grows larger and larger and larger and it gives an extra boost. So basically what you're doing is giving a boost at the very uh, low end. So let me just show you what that looks like on the graph we drew earlier. So a while back we drew this curve up here. So this is just our constant line, and uh, what can happen with this very basic scalar control um, is that as you go very low speed, this is a low speed region here, um, you could do be giving this a little bit of a boost, especially to get it started and so on. So I think in essence, as I say it's not documented really at all, but I think in essence what this little formula is trying to do and these parameters are trying to do is give you an adjustment that's more and more biased like that to the, to the low frequency, some kind of adjustment down here. So it'll end up creating something sort of like this and there's an offset voltage which moves it up and down and there's a percentage which is kind of how aggressive you want that curve to be I think is what, what it essentially amounts to. Um, I'll, I'll run it with it switched off at the moment because I've got 1.1 kilowatts so you might find that this is actually okay and we'll see how we go and if we get stuck when we're doing some drilling uh, we can always turn this on and experiment when it's actually on the drill there's not much I can do now it's on the bench I don't really want to hold the uh, shaft and <laughs> stop it turning that way but it's giving this boost at this low end according to these parameters. 
And I think it's, it's nothing more complicated than that. It's not, um, let's say, it's not closed loop or anything like that. It's just a, a boost function. And here's the front of the control panel complete after it's just been deburred. Wipe down a little bit of Scotch Bright. So you can see all the little grooves that are going to go into this top piece here. So that's the outer face. Looks uh, okay, yeah, I'm pleased with that. Let's see if it fits. So now I know it all fits okay. Uh, we'll put it back on the CNC machine, and we're now going to machine this side, and we've just got to do some uh, engraving, some of the letters. It's oh, a good fit. Okay, so it's pretty full now. So we'll let that dry and then I'll just touch up any edges.